Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Diabetes Tidbits, Updates on the Clinical Approach to Diabetes Mellitus in Dogs, sponsored by BI and Covectris. I'm Amy Booker, and I'll be your host today. Today is November 11th, 2020, and our live webinar participants will earn one continuing education credit. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, you are not eligible to receive any CE for it. Please note in the handouts pane of your GoToWebinar control panel, there is a handout. You're going to want to click on that and download it. It's fantastic. Um, also, our live participants today can ask questions. Simply type your questions into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel, and our presenter will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. I'm very excited to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Cynthia Ward. Dr. Ward received her VMD and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She completed residency training in small animal internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary Teaching Hospital and a reproductive and endocrinology fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She was on faculty at the University of Pennsylvania until 2005 when she moved to the University of Georgia, UGA. Dr. Ward has been honored by numerous teaching awards and was named the Josiah Meggs, Distinguished Teaching Professor of Internal Medicine at UGA in 2015. She is the co-founder and director of the UGA Veterinary Diabetes Clinic. She has an active research program in clinical and basic endocrinology and has authored numerous journal articles, book chapters, and research abstracts. Dr. Ward is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in Small Animal Internal Medicine. Dr. Ward, we are ready for your presentation. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining me this afternoon to let me talk about something that I love, which is diabetes mellitus. And of course, I'm starting out with a, a picture that makes me really happy. It's a basket full of schnauzers. And as an endocrinologist, I love schnauzers. I think everybody should have schnauzers. They get diabetes, they get Cushing's disease, they get hyperlipidemia, and sometimes they get all of that together. And that makes me really excited when I get to actually treat these animals and um, and manage their comorbidity. So anyway, I'm looking at this basket and I'm saying there are five potential patients of mine in the future and that makes me really happy. So today what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about um, how I think about diabetes mellitus. I've had the great fortune to be able to have started and uh, maintain the first and only diabetes clinic in the United States for, for pets. And uh, because of that, I have a ton of experience and seen a lot of really great cases. And I want to share a little bit of what I've learned about diabetes mellitus with you today. So we're going to go through the way that I sort of think about diabetes. And I separate it out into sort of four steps. One is the clinical signs. One, the second is managing comorbidities. The third is designing a treatment plan that, and we have to remember how important the owners are to us because we want to make sure we, we design something that the owners can actually do. And then we're going to talk about monitoring at the end. And I will be talking about the uh, continuous interstitial glucose monitoring that's become pretty popular now that the Libra sensors are much more available. These are a picture of two cats that I own now because my husband and I failed at fostering them. And so we ended up keeping them and I got this really nice little bench sofa to put out in one of my rooms, which they think I bought for them. So in thinking about diabetes mellitus, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on dogs today. And uh, remember that dogs get the easy kind of diabetes mellitus. And we do use the terminology that's used in human medicine uh, because it helps us to relate better to our clients. But uh, humans get type 1 and type 2, but diabetes and dogs get something that's very similar to type 1 diabetes mellitus. And this is the insulin-dependent form. Uh, what happens in this uh, form of diabetes mellitus is that the um, uh, beta cells, which are in the islets of Langerhans that are spread all throughout the pancreas, and they contain all the endocrine activity, of the pancreas, these cells are destroyed. We believe for a variety of reasons it's an immune-mediated destruction, but the beta cells are basically taken out. And if you don't have any beta cells, they're the principal cells that make insulin. Actually, they're the only cells that make insulin. And if you don't have them, you can't make insulin. So you are absolutely insulin dependent. Uh, so thinking now about how our dogs, and dogs are a lot easier to deal with than cats who have a non-insulin dependent form of diabetes mellitus. And so with dogs, it's a little bit more straightforward. 
So I thought I'd start off with the first step, and that is basically um, how we're going to diagnose and evaluate our patients. This is one of my favorite diabetes clinic cases and owners that comes in that come in. Uh, this little pug has diabetes and Cushing's disease and dental disease and cataracts and all kinds of stuff. Um, and the thing that I like best about them is that his mom always color coordinates her outfits with him. So since she has this black hoodie on, she wore her cream and black outfit. So the patients can present to us with a variety of clinical signs. I've listed some of these, and obviously you're all familiar with the clinical signs of diabetes mellitus. Big ones that we pick up in dogs are polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. And the reason that we tend to pick up on those so quickly is that they tend to be annoying to the owners. So who wants to get up in the middle of the night and let their dog out five times because they have to go to the bathroom? Who wants to clean up urine puddles? Nobody does. And if you have a dog like I do that has a beard, I even get tired of him drinking a whole lot because he gets water all over the floor. So these are things that owners tend to notice because it's annoying to them. So they may bring them in for that or for a variety of clinical signs, or the owners may come in for their yearly checkup and you start asking them some questions uh, and maybe find out that there's some abnormalities and what's been happening with them. Or maybe you're doing your physical exam and you're finding out, geez, you know, last year uh, Fluffy's muscle condition score was three out of three and now it's only one out of three. So maybe there's some muscle wasting going on or maybe you notice the start of some cataracts. Well, you get suspicious that there's a disease process going on. And because diabetes is so common, it's probably going to be kind of at the top of your list of the things that you think about. So you're suspicious of the disease, and we run blood work to help us diagnose it. And diagnosing diabetes mellitus is not the hard part of the disease for the most part. It's a pretty easy diagnosis to make. We just have to demonstrate appropriate clinical signs, hyperglycemia, and glucosuria. And the only thing that can mess us up is stress. Just like these two dogs here, these are my dogs. Um, when we introduced another foster failure, this white dog here, into our household, he and the other dog did not get along. You can see they're still mortal enemies. They hate each other. They don't even look at each other. And we were training them to coexist by placing on the same cushion, which they hated. But they have learned now to actually at least tolerate each other. And stress by no means, we think about a stress hyperglycemia in cats, but remember that dogs can get it as well. And all you have to do is go over the renal threshold for glucose, and it will happily go into the urine. And in the dogs, it, that's actually pretty low. It's only 180 milligrams per deciliter of glucose. So once your serum glucose goes over that, it goes into the urine, and you absolutely can get glucosuria. So stress can fool you in dogs just like it can in cats. Uh, even though it's probably less common. If you should ever have a question as to whether or not you have a stress hyperglycemia or real diabetes mellitus, you can always run a fructosamine, and that gives you the average blood glucose for the preceding two to three weeks, and if that's elevated, that's going to be more evidence in your arsenal that you actually have diabetes mellitus. The second step that I think about is what is special about the patient that I'm dealing with that uh, is going to be a factor in determining a good treatment protocol for that patient and his or her owner. Uh, this is another cat of mine, and of course, as an endocrino endocrinologist, all my animals have some problem. This is our cat, uh, Steve. He's 19, and he has hyperthyroidism. He has this really great uh, heated cat box that he gets to sleep in. He loves to hang out on the porch. And this is him um, dining out in the age of COVID. So some of the things that I think about when I'm trying to um, uh, determine the best uh, treatment protocol for my patients um, are listed here. Big ones at the top are spay-neuter status and any sort of active reproductive um, uh, hormones that might be uh, in play because all those hormones can cause insulin resistance and change the way that insulin can work on the individual cells. So can you treat an intact animal? 
or pregnant or lactating animal, absolutely you can. You can absolutely treat them with di for diabetes. But you have to remember that their insulin requirements are going to be higher when they're, the, when they're under the effect of the reproductive hormones. Uh, so during a heat cycle, they're going to require more insulin. And when males are having testosterone spikes, they're going to require more insulin. So if these owners are at all amenable or at all thinking about spaying or neutering their animals, that will only help you get them under control more quickly. So if they're willing to do that, or even if it's part of their thought process, I always mention that as an option. And, uh, and, and if they don't want to neuter their animals, that's fine. But make sure that they know it's going to be harder for you to get these animals under control so that they set some reasonable expectations. I like to have a discussion about the type of food and the eating habits of the animals. Um, food choices are not as critical in dogs as they are in cats, but if you, uh, but I like to find out how passionate people are about the kind of food they feed. We all know that owners have um, a lot of preconceived notions about what is best to feed their animal, and even after they undergo a very expensive nutrition consult. Um, they'll often go back and feed what they were feeding before, which tends to be like something horrible like Old Roy from Walmart. But, uh, but people are very passionate about what they feed. So I like to talk to them early to find out if I have any chance of trying to change the, what they're feeding and how they're feeding their pets. I like to start talking about exercise and weight control. We know that fat is an incredible inflammatory organ, and if an animal gains fat, it's going to um, then cause an increase in inflammatory cytokines that are released in the body, and all of those cause insulin resistance. And the other thing I like to start bringing into play is what's the exercise potential for these dogs? I mean, let's face it, we can all use a walk for sure, especially during COVID. We can all use walks, and diabetic dogs can use walks as well. There is a huge amount of literature in, in humans not as much in our dog species, but even in humans, they've demonstrated uh, very effectively that exercise has a beneficial effect on diabetes mellitus, even separate from weight control. So exercise can be very important for us as well. Concurrent diseases that I worry about that are the most common in diabetics I have listed here, and I have urinary tract infections in red because these are common and they're oftentimes very sneaky. They can be hard to recognize because sometimes animals won't even have clinical signs associated with them when they're diabetics. And also, they can not even show up on a urine, on a urine analysis. Their sediments may be absolutely clean. So we have to have a high index of suspicion for urinary tract infections. I also am concerned about concurrent endocrinopathies like hypothyroidism and hyperadrenocorticism. So if you're hypothyroid, you're not going to be metabolizing your fat uh, normally, and because you can have excess lipids and cholesterol in the bloodstream, that can interfere with insulin's ability to do its job. And the same for hyperadrenocorticism. If you have excess cortisol running around, it's going to be difficult for you to control, for, for insulin to do its work since the cortisol fights with insulin, so it's going to be harder to get them under diabetic control. So those are endocrine diseases that we want to kind of think about. I worry about pancreatitis, mainly because if I have a dog that is, has pancreatitis and is also diabetic, I'm going to be a lot more aggressive with insulin therapy than I would if the pancreatitis did not exist. And the other silent but deadly problem in diabetics is dental disease. And we talk about it, but it hasn't really been shown until very recently in a very large study in dogs that 20% of them actually have dental disease. And you figure you've got all that bacteria, um, you know, on the gums. Remember that diabetics are immunocompromised um, as well as uh, being diabetic. So it allows the bacteria to grow even more and the bacteria are releasing toxins. They're also releasing inflammatory mediators, all of which will interfere with insulin activity. So for testing, I really try to talk owners, and I know that they don't like to spend a lot of money. I mean, I don't like to spend a lot of money either, but if you can allow them to at least get you, let you get a minimum database, that can be really helpful for you. 
because we really want to identify concurrent diseases so that we can fix them or at least try to partially control them before we start our insulin therapy. So I like to at least get a CBC, a fasting chemistry, so that I can look at cholesterol and triglyceride levels, a urine analysis with a sediment exam, so that at least I can feel like I have an idea about what might be issues in these animals. As I said before, urinary tract infections are a big problem. And very often, the and up to 35% of the time, actually, you can have an occult UTI and a dilute urine. So you'll never even know you have a urinary tract infection if you have a very dilute urine, which we know a lot of these diabetics have. So when the urine is diluted, it'll split up those white blood cells, and it's, it can be hard to even see the bacteria. So it is worth your time and effort to get urine cultures if you can. That doesn't mean that you have to send out a really expensive urine culture and sensitivity on everybody. You can get in-house auger plates or these little paddle systems, and you can actually do the cultures in-house, which is a lot less expensive, because realistically, all you need to know is whether they do or don't have a UTI. If it's the first urinary tract infection, you can just treat it with a broad-spectrum antibiotic, if it's the second or third one, you can always scrape the colonies off these agar plates and get them speciated and get a sensitivity on it if you need to. But what you really want to know is do they or don't they have a UTI? Other things that you might consider are abdominal ultrasound and one of the organs that we'd really be looking at is the pancreas because, again, I like to identify pancreatitis because if it's present, I'm going to be much more aggressive with my insulin therapy. We can also look at the canine pancreatic lipase activity. Uh, and you know the SNAP tests are very sensitive. We have to confirm them with the SPEC CPL, but I would probably get the SPEC CP CPL anyway if I have pancreatitis because I'd want to follow that. And you can look at the numbers going down as the inflammation goes down. And that's a good way for you to follow the disease without having to repeat more ultrasounds. So the next step in my terms of thinking about diabetes mellitus is treatment. This is a picture of the white dog that came to our household again because of a monster failure activity with his UGA shirt on. So the one thing that I think about when I'm designing a treatment program for owners is exactly what are my objectives. Like what do I have to fix? And for the billionth time, I am so delighted not to be a human endocrinologist because in human diabetics, you really have to control their blood glucose. They get long-term retinal and glomerular effects, long-term vascular effects from um, being, being diabetics over time because of the hyperglycemia and the changes metabolically that occur because of that. And our pet animals just don't live that long to see those problems. And because of that, we don't have to keep their blood glucose between 150 and 200 all day long. Our treatment objectives can be much less stringent. So what do we want to do? We want to control clinical signs. We want to control the things that annoy the owners, the polyuria and polydipsia. We want to control the polyphagia. We want the animals to regain their muscle strength, um, fix their neuropathies if we can, to regain energy so they can participate in the family activities. And so when owners are walking them around, they're proud of how they look and they look and feel healthy and happy and the owners feel really good about the pets being part of their family. So we want to control their clinical signs to make them good pets. We also want to prevent emergency. So we don't want them to end up in the hospital with ketosis, hypoglycemia, or hyperosmolality. The other thing, and so the, the goals that we have are reasonably, they're, they're like these are pretty achievable goals, just doing this. And nowhere on there does it say that your blood glucose has to be 150 all day long. So these are things that we can pretty well achieve. And the other thing that I like to think about is trying to design something the owner can actually do. Sometimes I send owners home with bags full of medications, and I'm always thinking to myself, if I had to do that at home, there is no way I could do that. And sometimes we ask owners to do things that they just can't do. They get absolutely overwhelmed. And remember, the default 
for owners treating their animals with diabetes mellitus, if you make it too difficult on them, they're going to give up. So they'll either abandon the animal, they'll euthanize the animal, or they won't treat the animal at all. And there is a lot of data out to suggest that 30%, this is really interesting, 30% of animals are euthanized at diagnosis of diabetes mellitus or within the first year of diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. And that is so stinking frustrating because this is a disease, we can diagnose it, we can treat it, we can monitor it, and yet we lose these animals because uh, we've made the treatment protocol so difficult for the owners that they just can't do it. And most of what the owners cite as a problem are issues with their lifestyle. They don't want to be home all the time to give injections. Um, They're concerned about making the animal hypoglycemic. And they're afraid to travel because they're afraid of leaving the animal at a boarding facility or with a pet sitter. So, again, I try to design a protocol that that the owners can follow even if um, it's not totally optimal for the pet. Uh, And that includes, like, exactly what I ask the owners to do, like, how much can they really monitor? How much can they actually handle their animal? And then we have to think about how scared they are about needles. Needles are scary things. A lot of people are very frightened of them, and um, so we have to address how fearful they might be because of the needles. And then, of course, the finances, because diabetes can be expensive and very Um, difficult for a lot of owners that are financially limited to treat. So I try to die, I try to make an optimal plan for each owner and pet combination, realizing that sometimes what the owners can do may not be optimal for the pets, but it's better than them not being treated at all. So treatment for the stable canine diabetic is pretty straightforward. They have type 1 diabetes mellitus. We know that they're insulin deficient, so we know we're going to have to give them insulin. So we're going to start them on insulin once or twice a day, depending on what you're using. We like to feed the animals twice a day. And although diet is not as important in dogs as it is in cats, if we can change their diet, it's wonderful to be able to put them on a high-fiber diet. And, of course, you want to calorie restrict them. Remember, again, fat is an amazing inflammatory organ. And the fatter you get, the harder it's going to be for the insulin that you're giving to do its job. So one other way that I like to explain it to owners is if they let the animals gain a lot of weight, they're going to be on a higher insulin dose, and it's going to be more expensive for the owners as well. So sometimes pointing out the fact they might be paying more may get them to listen to you to really calorie restrict these animals. And as I said before, exercise is important. The body of literature is not as great in the dog as it is in people, but we are getting some data out there now. There's a study that's coming out from our laboratory on this. Uh, And probably the optimal time for the owners to exercise their animal is maybe an hour or so after they eat and get their insulin. And again, it doesn't have to be vigorous exercise. They can just go for a walk. And, And let's face it, we can all use a walk. So that brings me to insulin therapy, which is so confusing and it just doesn't need to be because look at how simple human insulin is. So this is the human insulin molecule. It's only 50 amino acids. It's a pretty simple structure. It's just got a A, whoops, an A and a B chain that are hooked together by some disulfide bond. So it's not a very complicated structure, but it's very complicated for us to think about with because we have so many choices of insulins that we give and that's where things get a little bit confusing in the veterinary world because there's so much out there that we can use and why is that that's because of the property of insulin itself so insulin is secreted in response to glucose absorption from the gi tract so you get hyperglycemic and um, that causes insulin to be secreted from the pancreas Well, the deal with insulin is that it works quickly. It works through cell surface receptors, mainly on the liver, adipose, and muscle cells, and it activates these cells. But if the insulin does not bind to these cell surface receptors, it is degraded pretty quickly. And the half-life of insulin in the bloodstream is about six minutes. Most of it's totally gone in 15 minutes. So 
the reason there are so many types of insulin out there is that we've had to do things to the insulin molecule to make it a timed release form so that we can give an injection and the insulin is released slowly over time, just like it would be from the pancreas. And there's a couple of ways that we do that, general mechanisms. One is that we can precipitate the insulin, and we see this in uh, NPH, Prozinc, and Betzelin. These are the cloudy insulins. And insulin crystals are usually precipitated with some sort of a protamine-zinc um, uh, combination that's inherent to each of the different insulins. And that causes the insulin to be cloudy because it's really a crystal of the insulin um, with the protamine and zinc molecules. And when you inject it under the skin, then the insulin molecule comes off of those crystals. And as soon as it does, it gets absorbed into the capillaries and then into the bloodstream. So it's a timed release form. The other mechanism is to mutate the actual insulin molecule. And there's a variety of insulins that we use that are mutated. So for instance, Detamir is mutated so that it's got a carbohydrate on the end of it. And when it gets injected under the skin, the carbohydrate binds to albumin, but it's not a very tight binding. And so then the insulin is released slowly over time. In Glargine, it's um, mutated so that it's stable at a pH of 5. So when you inject it under the skin and it sees a pH of 7, then it actually crystallizes and you form similar crystals that we see with the precipitated types of insulin. And then the actual insulin molecule then kind of falls off of those crystals and goes into the bloodstream slowly. But this is why we have so many different insulins out there on the market. Another thing that I like to think about when I'm choosing insulin is also whether or not they're FDA approved. And there are two that are FDA approved for us in veterinary medicine. And although we're blessed in this country in that we can use off-label um, uh, medication, meaning we can use drugs that are available that are not labeled for the species that we're using them in, uh, and that, that's actually not true in a lot of countries, but we can do that here. It is to your advantage to use something when you do have an FDA approved um, uh, treatment that is actually available for the species that you're treating. This protects you against any sort of legal ramifications, but also you get the full backing of the company. And I don't know if any of you have tried to call some of the human um, insulin uh, companies, uh, but if they find out that you're a veterinarian, they won't even talk to you. But if you call Behringer Ingelheim or Merck, about using their insulin products, they have to talk to you. And so you get the full backing of them um, with this product. So that is one advantage to using FDA approved drugs. So one of the things that I think about, and again, this comes out of having a conversation with the owners as to what they can actually do. And um, one thing that, um, one very popular insulin uh, that a lot of people use in dogs is NPH insulin. And that absolutely has to be given twice a day. But you do have some options if the owners say, hey, you know what, I can only use insulin once a day. Vesselin has long been shown, has been uh, labeled um, for use once a day for a long time. It hasn't worked that well in my hands once a day, but there's also Prozinc that has just been released on label for dogs, and that is also labeled to be used once a day. And what I'd like to show you is some evidence that came out of the Prozinc field trial that supports the longevity of Prozinc and also shows us some other really cool things about diabetes mellitus. So to let you know how I'm involved in this data, I don't work for Behringer Ingelheim. Um, I didn't do the study design. I didn't treat any of the animals that this was done as a field trial, meaning it was done in general practices all over the United States. What I did do was help BNI actually evaluate their data and then, um, and then decide, you know, what were the conclusions of the study and also to help them get it published. And this paper actually just came out in print yesterday. Uh, so I'm sharing a, some data that hasn't been out in the, in the public domain for very long. But the cool, the reason I wanted to get involved in this and the really cool thing about this study is that we're looking at glucose results from 276 dogs. About half were naive 
and half wore dogs that were treated with other insulins that did not respond well to them. And these dogs were actually treated with insulin once a day through day 42. So these are mean blood glucose. Uh, these are just regular bo uh, endocrine box plots. This means are the lines here, and then these are the ranges. Uh, and as you can see, we saw these are naive animals in, in this particular graph. As you can see, they do respond to prozinc insulin. That's not a big surprise because PCI insulins have been out there for a while, not prozinc necessarily having been used in dogs, but PCI has been, and it does work. But the really cool thing is that although we see a significant decrease through day 28, we see a further significant decrease at day 42. And that is the same um, data that we see with fructosamine. And you see a significant decrease early at day 21 here, and another one at day 42, which follows out through the end of the study. The cool thing for me, and I don't think B and I thought this was as exciting as I did, but the cool thing for me is that this really shows that we need to be patient when treating our diabetics, that it really does take four to six weeks for them to settle into their insulin therapy. And we've been saying that for years, It's even in the recent AHA guidelines, and this is the first data that we've had that's actually shown this. These are the glucose curves from um, the naive animals that were treated. These were nine-hour curves that were done after the owners gave um, insulin and fed the dogs at home, and then they were followed for nine hours. The cool thing here is uh, these stars indicate what is significantly different than baseline. The cool thing here was that even at nine hours post-treatment, we hadn't even got started to go back up to baseline levels indicating that, oh my gosh, prozinc really might be able to be used once a day in some dogs. But as I said before, um, it's not only glycemic parameters that we're excited about, it's also improving clinical signs. So if you take the data, and again, this data is just, there's so much stuff in this data. This is where we got all the stuff about the dental disease being present in 20% of the dogs, because we never see studies this big. We're always happy if we get like 20 dogs, and this was 276, 224 dogs, which are shown here, made it through day 84. So treatment success here was defined as you had to improve your glycemic parameters, but you also had to have an improvement in clinical sign. So um, this is, I'll walk you through the chart. These are the animals ju just responded by having better um, glycemic parameters as well as clinical signs, and they responded to prozinc. They were on once a day for at least through day 842, and you can see 72% of them responded. 28% did not. Not surprised about that. That makes sense to me. And some of the ones that didn't respond were ones that were hard to control diabetics. However, if you look at the vertical line, this is the cool part. Um, these are the animals that were treated once a day versus twice a day over 84 days. And as you can see, 60% of the animals treated once a day with prozinc insulin actually showed improvement in glycemic parameters and um, clinical signs which is very exciting because how many owners do you know that would love to treat their dogs once a day? I mean, that's just phenomenal. Um, we asked Berger Ingelheim to get better data, and they did some continuous glucose monitoring on using Prozinc once a day. These were done in laboratory animals, so not, uh, not a field trial. They were, um, there were eight dogs in this study. They had induced diabetes mellitus. But they were fed once a day, and, or they were, I'm sorry, fed twice a day in the morning and the evening, but only got prozinc insulin once a day. And this is what their continuous glucose monitors look like. This is a two-week average of one of the eight dogs. But as you can see, further evidence that um, it, is, it is useful as a once-a-day insulin in dogs. So taking all of that back, again, Prozinc, I showed some data to suggest that it might be another choice that you have as a long-term insulin in dogs and may be able to be used once a day. If you are going to use insulin twice a day and it doesn't matter what you use, um, I started a half a unit per kilogram twice a day dosing. Um, if you're going to use them once a day, you might want to go to 0.7 units per kilogram once a day. In the study, the naive diabetics were treated within that dose range 
the pre-treated diabetics were treated so that they took, like, for instance, if they got uh, whatever they got twice a day. So, for instance, if you got 10 units of insulin in a 24-hour time period or five units of insulin twice a day, um, they took the 10 units of insulin that you got in your 24-hour time period. They took 75% of that or 25% less of it, which would be seven and a half units, and they gave that once a day. And in the study, the dose was close to one unit per kilogram. In the final dosing for the prosing study, and again, this is a lot of diabetic dogs, so it gives us a lot of information about dosing. The final mean successful dose for those dogs was 1.4 units per kilogram per 24 hours. So we either divide that and give it twice a day or with 1.4 units once a day. So this brings us to the last step um, in sort of the way that I think about diabetes mellitus, and that is monitoring. And just remember for some general guidelines, it takes four to six weeks to control diabetes. I have to show this data again because it was so stinking exciting to see so much data from so many dogs. Um, but remember, just to remind you, um, we, have to re we have to be patient. I forget about that too because owners are always bugging me about stuff and I forget to be patient as well. But give these guys some time to get used to insulin therapy. And remember that if you're gonna change the dose or the type of insulin, Give them a good seven to 10 days before you even see what they're doing with it. Remember that insulin handling tech and injection techniques are the biggest reason why insulin fails. So have them bring in the insulin in syringes that they're using. I'm sure we all have stories about what you've discovered when you find out what the owner's really doing. And then if you have any question, have them demonstrate their injection technique to make sure they're doing it correctly. Also remind them they want to rotate sites on the animal's body to give the insulin because if you give it in one place all the time, you can get buildup of scar tissue and then the insulin's not absorbed well. My first week goal for my owners when they have a newly diagnosed diabetic, especially if they've never dealt with a diabetic before, is to have them just used to giving injections. I do not want them to get frustrated and I don't want them to give up. So I have the owners, my goal is, hey, you just need to give the injections and just see how the dog does. I try not to start um, diabetes therapy or insulin therapy if the owners are going to be traveling a lot that week. So maybe a time when they're home a little bit more, maybe not working so much. They don't have to sit next to the dog, but you want them to sort of be around to observe the dog and have them monitor for clinical signs, resolving, and also for any emergencies. Um, and I think to myself, because I'm trying to be really flexible in what I ask owners to do, and then I ask what they can realistically monitor. Well, everybody can monitor clinical signs, and one of our treatment goals is to get rid of these. So owners absolutely can, you know, see if their animal's feeling better, the energy level's better. Um, if you have a particularly annoying owner, you can give them a job and have them measure how much water the dog is actually drinking, and that can keep them busy for a while. But again, you, if they measure that, that gives you a really good sign about how your insulin may be working. And there was a study that came out a long time ago now where they compared uh, prediction to diabetic success based on resolution of clinical signs versus uh, uh, in-house glucose curves. And actually, resolution of clinical signs is a pretty good predictor of diabetic success success. We can look at physical parameters. And remember, this, some of these are going to take a while to resolve. So they're not going to build back up their muscle in a week. Um, they're not going to resolve a neuropathy in a week. But, um, but over time, we hopefully will see their body condition getting better. So we want them to build up their muscle mass. We want their muscle condition score to improve. We want their weakness and their neuropathies to get better. And so that's something that anybody can look at. Uh, we can do spot checks. I have urine here, and I know everyone hates urine, uh, but I actually use them for owners that can do it. Uh, keto diet sticks are very available on Amazon. They're pretty reasonably priced. And remember that unless the owners are pouring ketones or sugar on their lawn, if the dog just go, if the dog pees on the lawn, you can just stick that stick into the urine where it pools. And as long as the urine wets it, you can get a reading. So I certainly have them let me know if there's ketones. 
And I have them let me know if there's a bunch of negative glucose readings because if you don't see any glucose in the urine, you don't know if their blood glucose is like 170 and just below the renal threshold or if it's zero. Uh, some people feel very confident doing spot blood glucose checks. And if you do those, you want to do them when the insulin is actually working. The alpha tracks are great. They just take a tiny amount of blood. Owners will often ask if they can use their own glucometers, and they absolutely can. They're probably a little less accurate, although it probably doesn't matter that much. And the other thing that people can check at home is blood ketone levels. Again, because of ketogenic diet, these ketone meters are readily available. They're not that expensive. The Precision Extra is uh, uh, validated for use in the dog and the cat, and it measures beta-hydroxybutyric acid. It does take a little bit more blood than the alpha track, but it's absolutely doable with a good ear stick or even better um, if you can get uh, the owners to measure the glucose on the inside of the lip. That's a really good way to get a sample. We can also do long-term monitoring, and many of us use fructosamine because sometimes that's the only thing we can get. If you have that really nasty dog or cat that totally freaks out, the owners can't get blood at home, that may be the only number that you can get. Remember that it's going to give you the average blood glucose for the preceding two to three weeks because it's a complex that is a non-enzymatic complex that is insulin independent of glucose and albumin. So, um, and it takes about two to three weeks for albumin to break down in the bloodstream. So that's why it gives you, there's sort of that lag time period where you're looking at what the actual uh, control is. There has been some concerns about the accuracy of fructosamine, and there is data coming out saying that it's not as accurate as we wish that it were. So if you get a, a fructosamine number that doesn't agree with the way that your animal looks, then I would probably believe the animal and not the fructosamine. The other thing that we can measure is HbA1c, which is glycosylated hemoglobin. Um, and it's average, uh, gives you the average blood glucose for the preceding six weeks. It's used for people. There's an assay out there that hasn't been validated yet, so we'll see how accurate it ends up being. So the first recheck, I usually get the animals back in in a week or two, and I want to see how comfortable the owner is. I like to see the pet. If there's any questions about what the owner's doing, I have them demonstrate the injection technique. I have them bring in the insulin and the syringes and then talk about what the owner may be able to do at home. It could be by now they're used to the needles, it's not so scary, and maybe they'll be able to do some spot blood glucose checks at home. I evaluate their response to insulin. If their clinical signs are better, I keep them on the same dose. If they're no better, then I increase the insulin by 25%. And of course, I'll be checking the spot blood glucose and ketones in the, in the clinic. On additional progress exams, remember that fructosamine, you can only interpret it after you, the animal's been on a consistent insulin dose for two to three weeks. Um, I look for resolution of clinical signs and resolution of physical exam abnormalities and muscle mass improvement. I will increase the insulin dose by 25% in like two-week intervals until the dose is greater than one and a half units per kilogram, and that may signal there's a problem. Um, and normally, if I'm uh, looking at if changing an insulin, I'll give them a two solid increased doses and then consi consider switching to a different insulin type. The problems are when your insulin dose gets greater than one and a half units per kilogram, which signals insulin resistance, or you have ketosis, hypoglycemia, no resolution of signs or owner concerned. And here is a typical Samoji response that you might see. It's now called a hypoglycemic induced hyperglycemic response. And that brings us to the glucose curve because when you're in trouble, you gotta do a glucose curve if they're not straightforward. Glucose curves tell you how the insulin really works by looking at the glucose lowering effect of insulin. So you can determine the onset of action, the duration of action, and the time of peak activity, which will tell you what type of insulin you should use, and also look at the nadir, which is the lowest that the blood glucose gets, and that will tell you about the dose. We know what the problems are in the clinic. 
um, with doing glucose curves, and you get an animal like this, somebody's probably been bitten, um, and it's been very labor intensive, and you get a curve that you can't interpret. So that brings me to talking about continuous interstitial glucose monitoring. And this has really been promoted because of the advent of the Libra monitors, which are very, very easy to use, even though this has been around for many years in human medicine. The sensor is planted subcutaneously, and it measures interstitial glucose, which is going to have a delay of about 15 to 20 minutes from the blood glucose because it takes a while to integrate. The sensors last to two weeks and they're calibrated using an algorithm to a blood glucose measurement in this sensor. The readings are recorded every five minutes. So there's good and bad stuff about this. The good is that you see stuff at home. Um, you can get data over many days. It allows you to be very aggressive and to treat multiple endocrine diseases without worrying about making the animal hypoglycemic. The bad part about it, and we'll look at some curves, you have a lot of day-to-day -day vari variability, you get a lot of data that owners are going to want you to interpret, so you have to make sure that you've got reasonable charging mechanisms in place in your practice. And then owners also get too much information, and then they do stupid things like pouring maple syrup in their dog's mouth because they think the animal's hypoglycemic. So the lever is the one that people are using. Um, you have to, the information is stored here, but you have to pass the reader or the phone that behaves as a reader over it at least every 10 to 12 hours, um, or you will lose data. This is what it looks like on a dog, so they can go home with this. They can't go swimming, they can't get a bath, but this will stay on in two weeks and then the owners can take them off at home. And this is what you get. This is all calculated by the Libra website. You get day, daily graphs, and then you get a two-week summary graph, which is shown here. And uh, this is all figured out by the program itself. The Libra website, where the, the data is uploaded to that, will then calculate all this stuff to, for you and a bunch more stuff. So this all looks really good. The problem is, is that this is often what you see. So there will be huge variations from day to day on these glucose curves. Um, we know that the, that the Libra reads a little bit low, probably about 20 points. So when owners see this, they freak out and do the maple syrup thing, even though the animal was absolutely fine and the blood glucose was probably normal at that time. Also above 300, it probably reads a little bit high. So the best way to interpret these are to look at the, the average that you get over the two weeks before you make big decisions in changing your insulin. And also the other piece of advice I can give you is I tell the owners, look, I'm going to look at these every day so you don't have to because owners will absolutely freak out on you. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I, am, I, I kind of went through this quickly so we'd have time to um, answer any questions that you have. So I'm obviously delighted to do that. This is a great Pyrenees dog that was actually hypothyroid and the owner didn't understand that after the, the dog had to be treated for the rest of its life with thyroid hormone supplementation. So she stopped it and then didn't understand why the dog was better. So we ended up making him better. So with that, um, I am happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for spending your, uh, this hour of your afternoon with me. Dr. Ward, this has been great. And we do have some questions coming in from our Yay. audience. All right, I'm gonna read this first question exactly as it's written so I don't screw it up. Um, recommendation about use of fluoribiprofen to PX cataracts. Yeah, that's a great question. So for fluoribiprofen and cataracts, that's a great idea and use it. So what I have learned over time about cataracts is the inflammation in the eyes can throw off your glucose regulation for sure. And you know, owners a lot of times need to either get the money together or make a decision about treating cataracts. If you allow the inflammation to, um, to progress in their eyes, two things will happen. One is you'll get a pain, well, three things. A painful dog, you'll have um, unregulated diabetes because of the inflammatory response to the eyes. And the other thing is if the inflammation goes on long enough, you can actually cause a permanent retinal damage and then they won't do cataract surgery anyway because the animal will be blind. So fluorobiprofen is a great idea for, for any sort of cataract or any sort of eye irritation. It works really well and it should not interfere with your insulin um, treatment. 
Um, what is your experience with red light therapy decreasing blood glucose? Well, none, because I'm not sure I know what red light therapy is. I'm so sorry. I haven't heard of that. I'm not aware of it. So I can't say that I've heard anything about it. Red light? Red light therapy. Yeah, Jane uh, Jane asked that. Jane, so if you want to jump back into the, the questions and, and clarify what that means. Um, I don't know what that is, so I can't comment on it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, who do you decide to give ProZinc once a day or give twice daily? Who do you decide to so give? So I have, and actually one thing I'll tell you now is um, my cat, my diabetic cat that I have is on ProZinc once a day. I like to try it and see if it works. Um, I will say that many of the dogs that I see um, come into as a referrals into our diabetes clinic, and so they're pretty hard to control. And so those might not be the ones that would be most optimal for ProZinc once a day. But with a naive diabetic, I would try it and see if it works. Um, the worst case scenario is that you end up having to go to it twice a day or changing over to another insulin. But I think looking at the data that's out there in all those, I mean, it was a lot of dogs, you know, over half of them could get it once a day. So I think it's worth using. The ones that I would consider not using it with would be dogs that have like chronic pancreatitis because they're gonna have flare ups all the time and are gonna be hard to control. Dogs that may be a cushionoid diabetic, especially um, if they're if they're adrenal uh, dependent diabetics because they're gonna have irregular cortisol secretions. Um, Maybe animals like a non-neutered male might not be the best candidate either because they're going to have testosterone spikes. So anybody that would be a little bit difficult, might, it might not be the first choice for me. But if I had a straightforward, naive diabetic that walked in the door, I would try it for sure. Because um, if, you can, if you can do it and, um, and get away with it once a day, it'll save the owners a lot of effort. Um, at what glucose levels do you try to manage a feline on diet alone? That's a great question. Um, and under 350 milligrams per deciliter and no ketones. And I will say, um, I had, and this happened in our hospital, I had a colleague um, that was presented with a cat that was actually on cyclosporin and um, Pred like every other day or something like that. And uh, it, when it came in, it was ketotic. Um, and the blood glucose, I think, was only like 400. Anyway, they pulled the, the cat off those drugs, did not add in insulin and put it on a low-carb diet, and that cat got really, really sick. So if it's, keto, if it's ketotic, you know you need to give insulin, period. But if they're not ketotic and their um, blood glucose is less than 350, I would try them with a diet just to see if you can get away with it. Don't let it happen for very long. So give them about two weeks. And if they're not in remission, you probably need to add in insulin. Um, but it's worth it if they're, if they're stable and their blood glucose is less than 350. All right. Um, we got some clarification on the red light therapy. It's advanced, yeah. advanced photonic therapy using targeted red light for acupuncture points. Um, she says, I've seen a drop in blood glucose after I use the light for cancer treatment points. Really? You know, I can't comment on that, but I'm going to find out about it because um, we have a certified acupuncturist at our hospital. I'm going to ask her about it. I'm going to look it up. I'm sorry that I don't know about it to be able to tell you more, um, but I'm definitely going to look that up. All right. Um, here's a question about frequency of flirbiprofen drops. Mm -hmm. How often to give them? Um, I think our ophthalmologist likes to give them at least twice a day. Um, and it seems like that's what I remember the animals going home with is like twice a day flurbiprofen. Okay. Um, do you do insulin curves when you first diagnose diabetes? No, I don't. And, um, and uh, I'm assuming that it's really meant glucose curves. Um, no, I don't. Um, I like to let them really settle into therapy. Um, I have, I do a lot of Libras because um, I don't do a lot of in-house glucose curves anymore. I do do a lot of Libras because um, I see a lot of hard to control diabetics. But on a straightforward diabetic, um, I will treat them, and I may not even think about starting to curve them until they've been on therapy for, you know, like four weeks or so, especially if they're doing well at home. And then if, we, if they seem to be resolving nicely and, you know, they come in, we'll do a spot blood glucose, or maybe the owners are doing a few at home, um, I might not worry about a blood glucose at all. 
But I like to let them settle into therapy. And now that we have this data, which, again, kind of backs up what we've been saying over the years, that makes me even more confident in waiting, you know, four to six weeks before I really spend the money to do curves because they're, they're expensive. So I like to do it when I'm going to get the most bang for my buck. Um, here's a question about timing. How much can timing of insulin injections vary each day? That is a great question. This is one of those ones that, um, of course, you would love to have the owners do it exactly the same time every day. But let's face it, I don't think anybody can do that. So I try to, if they're on insulin twice a day, you know, certainly if it varies by a couple of hours, that's going to happen and it's going to be okay. I would say that it's more consistent to keep your morning dose consistent than it is the evening dose. The insulin requirements for most animals seem to be less overnight. So sometimes even we decrease the dose at night. Um, but I would say, I usually ask the owners or tell them plus or minus two hours if they can do that. Um, and same for once a day, you know, plus or minus two hours if they can do that. But having said that, I think all of us have had clients that have missed insulin doses or have varied them by a whole bunch more than that. And the animals seem to be fine. So again, two hours is great if they if the owners can do it, but realizing that maybe sometimes they can't. All right. Um, and this will be our last question. We have several more questions in the queue, but um, it is the top of the hour. Um, and we always have um, people who ask about cats. Um, what, uh -huh. what advice do you have for cats? <laughs> So cats are cats, right? Um, and they've got more complicated diabetics, right? So they've got uh, type 2, and we know that they're insulin resistant. So things that are really important in cats are weight control. Um, other things that are really important in cats are a low-carbohydrate diet. That's a big thing in a cat. So in dogs, if they're not going to change the diet, okay, that's one thing. I mean, a high-fiber diet helps them, but it's not, it's not a game changer. In cats, the low-carb diets are game changers. So that can really help you in a cat. I will say that uh, long-term insulins in cats, um, uh, um, usually we're thinking about Prozinc and Lantus as being kind of the long-term ones in cats. Again, I usually go for Prozinc because it's actually licensed by the FDA for use in cats. Uh, remember that remission in cats, um, probably the rate in the U.S. is somewhere around 20 to 25 percent, and you will get there more if you're aggressive. So those, so I'd start dosing cats at about a half a unit per kilogram to see if I can get them to go into remission. So that's kind of my basic overview on, on cats. You also can use Libras and cats. Um, I've seen some YouTube videos out there where people are putting them on their necks. Don't do that. It, we usually put them right on the shoulder blades, right behind the shoulder blades, um, so that when they walk, they don't interfere with them and don't wrap them because they'll pull them off immediately if they're wrapped. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all your expertise today. Thank you to BI and Covetris for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you to all of our participants. When you exit the webinar, you're going to see a survey. Please complete every form field and give us a few days to, because we manually process and email those certificates out to you. So thank you, everyone. This ends our webinar presentation.